everybody. Um, we're just waiting for some more participants uh, to join to join us. I think um, maybe some people are a little bit late, um, but uh, I just wanted to thank everybody who who has um, signed up and who who is taking part in the webinar today. My name is Alva Finn. I'm the policy manager with Mental Health Europe, uh, and I just kind of want to maybe um, explain a few things before we start. If this is an interactive uh, medium and we have actually never used it before, so you're joining us on our first ever webinar. If you're having trouble understanding things because I'm speaking too quickly or um, you're having some sort of tech technical problems uh, or you have questions um, or I'm speaking too loudly, just let us know on the chat. Uh, I have two colleagues here with me, Ophelie Martin and also Charlotte Poitier. Uh, who are also staff members of Mental Health Europe and they're going to be helping me field questions uh, and comments from you. Uh, so we want it to be as interactive as possible so every so often I'm going to stop uh, and ask if anybody has any questions. Um, is there any kind of technical issues at the moment that anybody has? Uh, you can use the chat box which is just to your right uh, and, and we'll respond to you via that. So unless there are any problems, uh, I think that we can kind of start. Maybe I'll wait to see if anybody has any questions. It doesn't seem like anybody does have any questions. Uh, for future reference as well, this is all being recorded. Uh, if maybe you could let uh, us know in the chat, com uh, the chat box or where you're from um, and why you're here. Uh, because I'm going to introduce MHE a little bit, but we would like to know who you guys are and in what context you're joining us. I'm just going to turn off the um, the, the camera now uh, and focus on, on the PowerPoint, uh, but do let me know if we're, we're going too quickly. Okay, so a little bit about uh, MHE. We are a European umbrella organization that focuses on mental health. We're actually the biggest European mental health organization working in, in, at European level. We represent 73 member organizations from across 30 different European countries uh, and also Israel. We're, we've been active in the field of, of mental health um, and working towards the European institutions for, for quite some time. Uh, and our members, uh, who are probably the most important part of Mental Health Europe, are um, a mixture of service providers, users, ex-users, volunteers, family members, carers, and, and uh, mental health professionals. Um, our values are um, very important to us. We're underlined by a human rights-based approach, uh, which is predominantly, um, we're predominantly focusing at the moment on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, we also have a recovery-based approach, so we believe that uh, recovery is possible for everybody. Uh, we advocate for mainstreaming of mental health uh, in all policies, uh, and we fight stigma and defend the rights of persons with mental health problems uh, and that includes things like focusing on deinstitutionalization uh, and promoting community-based services. So what we're here today to talk about and I, uh, I hope that some of you have read the toolkit um, that accompanied this, um, this webinar. Uh, if, if you guys have it, I will be sometimes pointing to page numbers um, if, that, if that helps you. Um, and yeah, so I don't think anybody has yet used the chat function. Okay, um, but do let us know where you're from and why you're here and if you've ever been involved in, in the UNCRPD process or another treaty body process, please do share your experience um, because I think that all the other uh, participants can see your answers. Is that the case? No. Okay, so well, I'm going to go through the reporting process of the of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, but keep in mind that a lot of the other treaty body processes um, are very similar or almost exactly the same. Um, 
So I'm going to use the highlighter function. Um, the reporting process starts with the state report. Uh, and then it moves on to the list of issues after the state report is considered by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, and after that, it goes on to a constructive dialogue that takes place in Geneva in front of uh, the, the Committee, where the Committee asks um, the state under review what uh, more questions about the state report, things for clarification, um, and then the main outcome what everybody is kind of looking for are the concluding observations and concluding observations are made up of recommendations to, to states under review uh, and then I suppose afterwards probably the most important thing is once you get these recommendations uh, and if any of them are useful to you um, you want to be following up with that uh, so putting the state under pressure to have them implemented, but also following up if there is there's any need to follow up with the committee itself. After I go through the reporting process, I'm going to have a question and answer section. Uh, I will be trying to take questions if any of you ask any uh, during the the, the presentation. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide if there are no questions there. So a little bit more about the UNCRPD itself. Uh, it came into force in 2007. It was actually adopted uh, by the General Assembly of the UN in 2006. Uh, the EU uh, and most of its member states are parties, state parties to to the um, to the convention, except for my own home, home country, Ireland. Um, Finland have, recent, uh, have recently ratified, and the Netherlands have passed it in their parliament and are just going to deposit. Uh, the treaty um, soon. So yeah, Ireland are the only uh, member state of the European Union left to left to fully ratify, but everybody else has signed. Um, so I do want to point out that even if your country uh, hasn't fully ratified, they are still bound not to go against uh, the convention if they've if they've signed it. Um, the European Union is also. Uh, a, st a, a party to to the to the convention, which is very important for mental health Europe. That's what we actually work on mostly here. We follow um, the implementation and and, and monitor uh, that implementation by the EU of the convention. So um, we actually have a little bit of experience having gone through this ourselves. We were involved in most stages of the process. Um, and maybe a little bit more about the background of, of the treaty. It's based on a social model of disability which moves away from a kind of medicalized model uh, of disability where you see a person who has a disability um, as a rights holder and not the object of, of care. They're, they're a subject and a rights holder. Um, in the past, people, persons with disabilities were seen uh, as maybe people who needed to be taken care of, uh, but this really empowers them as people who have uh, have capacity and have the ability and, um, and uh, it kind of works as a panacea against the discrimination and the stigma that people, persons with disabilities uh, faced in the past. Um, and what we're, I suppose we're here to talk about today is that the convention actually set up a committee of 18 independent experts uh, which review state parties to the convention. Um, and it's a, an obligation under, under the convention to, to, to report to this independent expert uh, body, which we call the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and the principles, the, the, the general principles that underline the UNCRPD uh, are inclusion, independence, equality of opportunity, non-discrimination, which I would imagine is the kind of cornerstone um, of, of, the, of the treaty, that every person with a disability is treated on an equal basis with others. And this, this phrase uh, is repeated throughout the, the, the articles. Autonomy is also very important, particularly for um, people who have psychosocial or intellectual disabilities. Um, we focus on that, on that uh, target group 
at Mental Health Europe, people with psychosocial disabilities. Uh, it would be interesting to hear uh, if any of you uh, have psychosocial disabilities or are advocating on behalf of persons with psychosocial disabilities. Uh, another um, very important um, principle is reasonable accommodation uh, and also accessibility. So that's very important for people who have um, other disabilities, uh, maybe wheelchair users, um, persons who, who use different forms of communication, like sign language. Uh, so those are very important um, general principles. We have one question here from Carl. Uh, why is Ireland not yet ratified? Uh, actually, I went to a disability high-level group here um, the other day, and the expert on disability uh, from Ireland explained that, and I, I think it was the same explanation for why Finland and also the Netherlands didn't uh, ratify, um, because they have a have a, a policy that if they are not in line with the convention, they won't sign it until all of their their legislation is in line with the convention, and this is what Ireland is still doing. Uh, it had a number of very old laws. Uh, that um, were very actually quite offensive. For example, uh, one one law that called uh, persons with psychosocial disabilities lunatics. Um, so yeah, they needed to bring all of that in line, and they're hoping to get get to a uh, get to the point where they can ratify by the end of this year. Uh, but yes, a very unhappy um, position to be in, and they realise it themselves. I have another question as well: Is the European Commission Commission still a member of the committee? Um, I'm not sure what that question means exactly. Maybe it's in reference to the framework, the European framework, which uh, monitors um, the implementation of the UNCRPD. Uh, if that's the question, then no, there aren't any more. Um, they still need to formally, legally um, uh, remove themselves, but they don't go to the meetings anymore, if, if that's what the question was about. Um, so moving on to monitoring mechanisms for the UNCRPD. Uh, there's also a complaints procedure uh, and if you have the toolkit in front of you or you have it open you can turn to page three uh, where the complaints procedure is outlined but the most important thing to, to note is that if your state is not uh, a state party to the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, then they don't actually uh, uh, come under the complaints procedure. The complaints procedure is a, a procedure where a person, an individual, or maybe a group of people on, on an individual's behalf, and even in interstate um, complaints can be made uh, to the, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of a quasi-judicial -judi procedure. Um, the the recommendations or the, the findings that come out from, from these cases, they're not legally binding, uh, but they do have authoritative weight. So a lot of uh, member states or state parties will change um, something as a result of a negative finding on the basis of a complaint procedure. And it's really a way for uh, individual citizens um, to be able to, to access the committee um, in, a, in a real way. The next thing is the universal periodic review. Uh, this is a bit of a, a different function and it's 1.2 on page 3. It's a peer review system that works between uh, states. Uh, it takes place in the human rights the Chamber of the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Um, and you can input, input to it by doing alternative reports, and it considers all human rights, not just what's under the convention. So it does necessarily um, deal with the rights of persons with disabilities. A lot of recommendations are received by states who have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, and a lot of these are repeated over and over again. So Ireland actually, uh, because I'm from Ireland, I, um, uh, I kind of watched the, their engagement with the human rights system, and they received something like over 40 recommendations to ratify the UNCRPD in their recent EPR. Uh, and that happens every four years. Uh, there's a more of a limited role, but if you want to, to know how to engage um, as civil society with the Universal Periodic Review, uh, you can send me questions. Um, I actually yeah, worked in Geneva for quite some time, uh, so, so I'm very aware of how that works and where um, 
where civil society can input. Uh, then the CRPD review process itself, uh, we'll talk about that obviously going forward, but I just want to draw your attention to the other treaty bodies. Uh, other treaty bodies also take into account the rights of persons with disabilities and the, 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 the jurisprudence of, of most of the committees actually inform each other. Uh, a lot of the recommendations in the Universal Periodic Review, for instance, are just repeated recommendations from the Committee on Torture, the Human Rights Committee, which deals with civil and political rights, the Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, uh, etc. So there are more. There's also the CEDAW Committee, which deals with rights of women, and the Committee on the Rights of, uh, of the Child. So don't maybe, if, if you have a lot of capacity to work on human rights, uh, it's also good to focus on the other treaty bodies because the more recommendations your state receives on a particular topic, you know, the more pressure there will be for them to, uh, to implement. So moving on to the actual reporting process itself a little bit more in depth. And if any of you are looking at the toolkit, um, you can turn to page four and that actually tells you the four sta stages where national NGOs can engage in the review process. Uh, so the first um, thing that all states have to do and are obligated to do under the convention is to report periodically to uh, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and from the very get-go, you can in input into that because states are required uh, to consult with civil society and DPOs, which means disabled persons organizations, um, when they're formulating that. Um, the, the Article 35 of the, the Convention actually obligates states to provide a report on implementation of the CRPD within two years of the entry into force of the Convention and thereafter every four years. Uh, but I do want to stress that the reporting system is actually quite onerous um, and many states, particularly small states, are, are a little bit far behind on their treaty body reporting. Um, so if your state if your state is behind on that, maybe just keep in touch with the department uh, who who is going to be who is going to be putting to, it together to see when it's going to come out. Um, then after the state prepares its its report and, and submits it, um, you can also do an alternative report. And I think that's one of the most powerful tools that civil society have to engage with the process. Um, a lot of NGOs and DPOs get together to do to do one together, and I, I really think that um, it's it's important to remember that the committee members are not paid. Uh, they're they're voluntary positions, of course. They're they're very prestigious positions, but you know they have to fit all of these um, review processes into a, quite few sessions every year. Uh, so it's really important to remember that if you are trying to communicate with them, the easiest way is to collaborate with other DPOs and have a very comprehensive document. Um, and maybe I'll just say a few things that your alternative report should or could deal with. Uh, it should, should, should provide kind of up-to-date information, maybe up-to-date information uh, versus what was provided by the state. Um, there are deadlines um, in relation to, to, to handing these to the committee, but actually it's only one month before the state report is actually considered uh, at the concluding observations. So there's often there's quite a lot of time for you to do this uh, and for you to provide updated information. So sometimes you know the state can provide the state report and then it won't be reviewed for another two or three years. Um, so, so yeah, staggering your report uh, might be a good idea. Uh, some of the things you can include in are, you know, as statistics are always very helpful. You know, how many people with dis with psychosocial disabilities or uh, any other disability are living in poverty or at risk of living in poverty? Um, what about recently adopted legislation? Very important. Um, the, the legislative framework for protecting people with disabilities is very important to the committee. Uh, parliamentary inquiries or reports uh, on maybe, uh, for example, abuse of people in institutions. Um, that's important. Uh, state policies and programs relating to the implementation of legislation as well as budgets. Uh, that's something that they consider quite often actually, uh, budgeting uh, and whether or not budgets are, are providing for uh, persons with disabilities. 
decisions, quasi uh, uh, decisions of judicial bodies or quasi judicial bodies uh, like courts. Uh, and what does your National Human Rights Institute have to say about uh, the treatment of persons with disabilities? Um, some important articles for persons with psychosocial disabilities. Um, Article 5 on equality and non-discrimination. Article 6 on women and disabilities. Um, equal recognition before the law under Article 12. Uh, what we call here uh, in Mental Health Europe legal capacity is very important for persons with psychosocial disabilities. Um, without that, uh, without having legal capacity, there's a lot of rights that they're denied. Um, it also it impacts their access to justice, for example, uh, liberty and security of the person. Uh, that's very much related to institutionalization. Um, freedom of torture or cruel or inhumane or degrading treatment under Article 15. Um, yeah, so there's quite a lot of articles, but you can see them on page eight, maybe. Uh, and I'll go back to the to the actual session or the the process itself. Then after that, after the state uh, report is considered, uh, a list of issues is is considered by the committee. Uh, and this list of issues is a list of questions that the committee wants more information on. Um, so. That's another area where you can possibly input into afterwards because you can also provide a response uh, to the response from the state uh, to the list of issues. So then after that, um, you have the pre-sessional preparation meeting, and I'll talk a little bit about that later um, before the constructive dialogue. Um, that happens on the same day as the constructive dialogue, uh, and it's a little session where NGOs or visiting de delegations of DPOs can sit before the committee um, without the state there, where sometimes they have a representative but they don't speak, uh, and you can talk about the issues. Um, and then after that, the concluding observations come out of this constructive dialogue and follow up. Um, so, yeah, a little bit m more about the reporting process. Uh, I think I've pretty much dealt with a lot of it already. Um, but it's important. I, I do. I encourage anybody who, or any of our members who are who are listening, to to get in touch with your national disability council or maybe your national human rights institution, and see if the per perspective of persons with psychosocial disabilities is included in the alternative report, um, because that's sometimes the only report that the committee actually reads. Because again, as I told you, they're under a little bit of pressure. Um, so yeah, a little bit more about what should be in your alternative report. The state report is very much, um, you know, what they what they want to say, and they're going to probably present a very, you know, optimistic view of how they're doing. Um, so I think that it's really the the responsibility of DPOs and civil society nationally to make sure that their their report is an honest reflection of the situation. Um, another thing that you should probably use is the jurisprudence of the committee, where possible. Uh, they have general comments that one comment, a general comment that I find very useful in my work is the general comment on Article 12, which was the very first one adopted. There's also guidelines and then um, the complaints that they've received through the complaints procedure that I mentioned earlier and also the concluding observations. It's very telling what other recommendations have been received uh, by other European member states uh, because a lot of the legislation on, for example, persons with psychosocial disabilities, mental health uh, legislation is very similar. Um, so if you want to know maybe, yeah, what, what recommendations could come out or how to formulate the recommendations that you might suggest in your alternative, alternative report, uh, then maybe follow those formula formulations. Um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, I, I don't think. Uh, so we have another question here from Elise. If state legislation has to be compatible with the UNCRPD, should a reform of psychiatric care precede the ratification? In, in my opinion, yes, that's absolutely true, uh, Elise. Um, but actually what we're seeing is that 
probably a lot of these ref reforms aren't going far enough, um, and, and uh, yeah, which is which is a real uh, pity. Um, so I explained a little bit about the articles there, but there's a few that you, more that you can see. Um, another thing that's very important to our work at Mental Health Europe um, is Article 19 on living independently and being included in the community, and that's basically about support um, to keep people uh, from being institutionalized uh, and making sure that they're able to, to make decisions about where and with whom they live. Uh, and that they have the right to support to do that. Uh, another thing that's very important to us at Mental Health Europe is Article 12, or, sorry, Article 25 on health. Um, we see that uh, you know a lot of health systems prioritise physical health over mental health. Uh, so that's something that we're focusing on a lot here. Uh, and of course, Article 27, equal ac access to to the open labour market is very important too. Um, we can't have inclusive societies if people with psychosocial disabilities or other disabilities are excluded from from work. So, what's next after you you write an alternative report? Well, get it out there, you know, disseminate it. Make sure as many people who are relevant to this this discourse are reading it. Um, so, tweet it. Send it to your to your colleagues. Make sure that people in the ministries in your state who are responsible for persons with disabilities are reading it as well. And also, it's always a good idea to send it individually to the actual committee members themselves to make sure that they're reading it. And if it's very long, please highlight those. I am always one for writing cover emails. Uh, we often write long position papers, which are obviously very useful for some people who have the time to read them. But if you are a section of a very long alternative report um, is you know 25 pages in, please bring that to people's attention, uh, because not everybody has has the time to read read very exhaustive reports. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll explain a little bit more about uh, the list of issues. Uh, so after it'll usually be considered after the state report probably sometime maybe a little bit uh, and if you want to to look at this on page 9 um, 2.3 of the toolkit deals with the list of issues uh, so yeah it depends on on what the time frame is because uh, the committee is a little bit under pressure as a new uh, um, human rights treaty body uh, but usually after this, the state report happens, then it, it happens a few months or maybe a year afterwards that they consider the report and then look at the issues uh, of concern. Uh, and that's where your alternative report would come in. Um, because if you send it before then and it has the most up-to-date information, then that might uh, give clues to the committee about what questions they should ask. Um, states must respond within three months to that to that uh, list of issues, and when they respond, sometimes uh, people respond to that response, um, so that when it actually comes to the constructive dialogue in Geneva on the day that the the committee have have the the most uh, up to date information. Um, so and the same things are usually included uh, in in those in the kind of list of issues. Um, as would have been in your alternative report, but maybe a little bit more focused on the basis of those. And I would advise anybody who wants to get involved with the process uh, to really take a look at other people's alternative reports. They need to be submitted in a in a in a, a UN language. Uh, there is some some word limits depending on which one. So do look at the OHCHR website for this, the the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities because they always specify what the actual word limit is. Um, but a lot of the reports are as a result in English. So have a look yourselves uh, and see what issues are are being covered by other people. Um, and I always think that the structure is very important as well. So going in order of the articles um, is kind of common sense. Um, so moving on to the constructive dialogue, uh, which I think it's very expensive to go to Geneva, but it's very worthwhile because it gives you the opportunity to speak face to face with committee members and doing, I know this is sometimes seen as a bad word, but lobbying. Um, 
you know, doing targeted advocacy around the recommendations that you want to see for your whoever your target group are. Um, I found it very useful. I went to the the review of the European Union in Geneva last August, um, and yeah, we we went with a, a large delegation of European um, DPOs and civil society, and uh, we got at Mental Health Europe the recommendations that we wanted, and a lot of those recommendations. Are, were issues that weren't dealt with in the list of issues. Um, so the committee are listening to civil society. So what I would say is if you have the capacity and you have the time, it's well worth it to go to Geneva if you want to see a recommendation on, on your issues. Um, so yeah, look up who, who the committee members are. Uh, see which ones have have a focus on, on your target group. So there's some that you know might have psychosocial disabilities themselves, some who might be hearing impaired, some yeah, who would have a focus on, on certain groups, and maybe look at and see what their background is uh, and, and contact them. So we have another question. Where can you find the alternative reports on the list of issues? Uh, this is from Annette. Um, well, I can send you links to that, Annette. But actually, if you look in, in um, if you look on the OHCHR website, you can just Google Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and it's the first thing that comes up. Um, and you can go and look at the list of issues there, uh, and the alternative reports should be there as well. Um, yeah, and also there's a, a little kind of drop-down box where you can look at country-specific information. Uh, another thing that you can do is go and look at the Universal Periodic Review Alternative Reports because that also shows you um, a more general kind of um, idea about the state of human rights, uh, but you can always, it, it, usually they cover disability as well. Um, so I talked to, and um, yeah, maybe I should say where exactly in Geneva it is. So in the in the toolkit, we we had directions and how to get there and that kind of stuff at the very end uh, for for people who wanted to go. But it's in Palais Wilson. It's usually over two days and it's divided uh, between two sessions, so six hours, three hours each. Uh, and the state is the only person, or the only the state under review uh, and their delegation are the only people apart from the committee members who get to speak. So I have been to to some um, uh, to some reviews where where people have uh, you know shouted things out. That's really not appropriate. Uh, the pre-session um, or the pre-review dialogue with civil society is where you get the time uh, to, to bring your grievances before the, the, the committee members. Um, so yeah, uh, another thing that I think is really useful during the actual dialogue itself is to be tweeting. Um, make sure that you have the, there's always a hashtag for each session uh, and that acts as a really good record for you and other people um, who might be following at home about what happened exactly, what questions were asked, uh, that kind of thing. I still look back on, on some of the reviews that I went to uh, and look at the Twitter handle and see what questions were asked. Um, you can also have side events um, and ask committee members, certain committee members maybe to speak. Um, uh, you have to apply one month before the session. Um, and yeah, if you if you want to do it on 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 certain themes, uh, that would be you know that would be quite good. Maybe if you had one on psychosocial disabilities, maybe if it was on uh, psychiatric reform or things like that. Um, if you're working on psychosocial disabilities, but yeah, it's another way of uh, basically getting your issues out there uh, in and around the time of the constructive dialogue. Um, it's during not. One sec. It's during non-official meeting time, um, so just keep that in mind. Cancel. Um, and the other thing to remember about going to the constructive dialogue is that you need to be accredited to enter. So just make sure that you're getting in touch uh, with people there and seeing um, or making sure that you, you're able to actually enter the building. Uh, another kind of handy tip from me for the pre-sessional is that a lot of other people will be there from other states who are under review at the same time. So make sure that you get in early to get a good seat. Um, uh, and another thing I suppose uh, that I should say about the pre-review and actually the whole uh, process of going to Geneva 
is to, to really collaborate with other NGOs. So during that pre-sessional meeting, it's not very long, sometimes it's like under an hour. Uh, so imagine if you're going with all these DPOs and everybody wants to, to have their voice heard, a good thing to do is to have a pre-meeting uh, and arrange who's going to deal with what issues because some, some articles really are very important for a lot of uh, persons with psychosocial disabilities. Uh, and other disabilities as well. Um, we know that a, a lot of our issues at Mental Health Europe overlap with uh, persons with um, intellectual disabilities. Um, I've just remembered that I have this handy highlighter, so I'm going to start to use it. Um, the concluding observations usually come out a few weeks after the actual, um, after the review took place or the constructive dialogue took place. And they are the real end product. You know, that's what you're aiming for. You want these recommendations uh, to address issues that you have brought up in your alternative reports, in your response to the list of issues, uh, in your meetings that you had bilaterally with committee members. All that work, you know, is really to get a recommendation uh, so that you can be using these recommendations to, to lobby your government to change things for people, people with psychosocial disabilities. Um, and yeah, they, they, they're, again, we have to remember all the time that this is a voluntary process that states sign up to. It's not like going to a court. These are not legally binding recommendations, but they are considered authoritative guidance. Uh, and you know, states are embarrassed when they, when they go to, to, these, to these meetings and they haven't changed things. Um, but it's also important to remember that uh, human rights change can be very incremental. Um, some things change slowly, uh, while other th things might change very quickly. For example, I suppose um, what I could say about the, the European Union, they have limited competencies on certain things. Um, for example, on Article 12, uh, they don't have full competency on that. It's actually member states who have that on legal capacity. So um, it's important to remember that yeah, they 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 did have some competency on the accessibility, and straight after uh, they received a recommendation on the Accessibility Act to say, you know, finally bring this out. It happened, you know, two or three months after. So I mean, that is an example of how receiving a recommendation can have really quite um, imminent uh, impact. Um, so opportunities for, for NGOs uh, from those recommendations. Again, dissemination is absolutely key. Uh, who is going to find out about these, these uh, kind of these recommendations that are coming from, from Geneva? Um, we need to get, get these things out into the public, uh, raise awareness about the recommendations that were received, uh, try to get them in the media. Uh, I remember when, uh, when I was involved in, in, in processes in relation to Irish re reviews, uh, you know, people asked, uh, asked um, reporters to come with them and to follow the review so that there would be something in the media afterwards and so that your citizens uh, and the people who live in your, in your state and also the persons with disabilities know that these recommendations have happened. Uh, the other thing is I'd say use the recommendations in, in your policy work. Use them as leverage. Um, do they support some of the things you've been saying for a long time? They probably do. So do insert them into your, your, your policy strategies. Uh, and most importantly, hold states to account. They have obligations under these treaties. Um, under the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, if they've if they ratified it, and you need to hold them to account because it can be lost in the day-to-day -day organization of governments, and uh, you need to be kind of driving this home yourself. Um, and the committee are very clear on the role of of uh, civil society in having recommendations implemented. You know, they really need your help because they have very limit, limited capacity. Uh, and they can't uh, go to your country and, and publicize these things. Um, so that's very important uh, to remember as well. Are there any other questions at this stage? I realize that we're going quite quickly, but uh, um, do let us know if anybody needs a break. So follow up, 
Uh, I think we've already talked about that a little bit more, but yeah, reference it in your po policy work, encourage reforms, um, adoption of programs, uh, and also trainings. Um, a lot of uh, member states or state parties to different conventions receive uh, quite a lot of recommendations on training people on, on the UNCRPD. It's not something that's very easy for people who are outside the kind of human rights policy bubble to understand. Uh, so yeah, push them to, to publicize it themselves. Uh, that's often uh, a recommendation that they receive. You know, they, they should do more training, more awareness raising on what uh, human rights are about and what the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is about. Um, and I can't stress this enough, one of the most important things is that the next time that the state comes under review, you need to be monitoring their implementation of the recommendations. Once they receive these recommendations, they will be restated over and over again in at various different points uh, in, in the treaty body review sessions and probably in other treaty body review sessions as well. Um, and they will be saying what they want well, they'll be saying quite optimistic things about how they're progressing on the recommendations. So I think it's always the job of civil society to be balancing that di that discourse and that dialogue um, and giving uh, the perspective, particularly of people with disabilities. So when you're writing your alternative reports, when you're writing your list of issues, um, make sure that you're, you're asking persons with disabilities themselves, how do they feel about how their rights are being implemented by the state? Um, yeah, and I suppose it's it's up to up to you to keep getting involved in each review cycle. Um, the review cycle of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is a little bit slower than others um, because it's very new. A lot of people haven't even gone through their first review. Uh, for example, yeah, just one example: the European Union has been reviewed now, but the next date for its next review is not till 2021. Now that's very far away. A lot of things are going to change by then. Um, so it's important to kind of remember that you will need to be using these recommendations for quite a long time to come. They might be the only ones you receive for eight, nine, ten years. Uh, so yeah, keep hammering away at it and don't let the state forget. Um, so I have another question here. Schemes for, for benefits for persons with disabilities don't always mention persons with psychosocial disabilities and only mention mental health problems and intellectual disabilities and thus exclude specific needs. Is it acceptable according to the UNCRPD? Um, well, I would say that most that benefits sh systems should apply, obviously, to persons with psychosocial disabilities, but a lot of people use mental health problems as a kind of broader definition. Uh, you know, this is new terminology. The term psychosocial disabilities isn't actually in the convention itself. It's used by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So it's taking uh, taking member states a, a little bit longer to to adjust to that kind of um, to that terminology. Uh, obviously, I believe that it is it's it's not compatible to exclude persons with psychosocial disabilities from benefit. Um, schemes, uh, but this is a common thing that we hear at Mental Health Europe that people who have uh, are having who need support don't get it because they're not considered to be people with uh, disabilities. And I think it's up to all of us to to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we will end at around 12, I think, because we, we, we gave an hour and a half because we didn't know how the logistics of this was going to work because it's our pilot. Um, but uh, we're going to allow for 30 minutes um, or 10 to 15 minutes for questions and uh, answers just in case. Uh, but I just want to go to the, through this last um, slide because it's a kind of useful timeline. Um, I'm trying to move this so that you can see it. Uh, but yeah, this is a little timeline with things that are coming up, uh, different review sessions. So Italy, uh, their state report is going to be reviewed uh, and a list of issues will be considered um, in this, this upcoming August session. And then the Cyprus list of issues is going to come out in this, in this September session. And then you can see that 
uh, review sessions will be happening for the those European states that we've indicated uh, in the centre, Cyprus, Estonia, France, Greece, Latvia, Luxembourg, Malta, Norway, Poland, Slovenia, Turkey, the UK and Ireland apparently. Um, I don't think that could be Ireland because they haven't ratified. Um, and then we have another list of deadline for submissions of documentations. Uh, so yeah, that's how you'll know that a state report has come out. Um, and then you can start working on your alternative report. And we'll send uh, these on to the, the slides on to other people uh, or anybody who's who signed up on all the attendees. Um, but you can also check a list of that um, in on page 13 of the toolkit. Um, so yeah, now we're going to allow time for discussion um, using the chat tool uh, to ask questions. But I just wanted to say. Uh, before that, um, that we want to hear your thoughts and to see how we can improve uh, on on this kind of forum. And so, please, when we send you the online survey that we're going to send you um, later today, can you please respond to it? Uh, we're going to ask questions about what you thought about the content, how things worked, uh, yeah, uh, and we would really really appreciate any of your feedback. Uh, so another question that I received, um, what are the consequences if the country does not comply with the recommendation? Well, as I said, the recommendations are not binding. So what will basically happen is uh, the committee will usually shame them a bit during the next review. Uh, and you guys should be doing that yourself. Uh, as well, uh, bringing it up in, in different fora, you know, um, I think it's always good when these kind of issues are discussed at parliamentary level as well. Maybe you have a disability intergroup or a disability committee in your parliament, get them to discuss this uh, and get them to hold other parliamentarians ac uh, into account. Um, uh, so I have another uh, one from Carl here. If we want to influence our country's state report, how much time in advance should we lobby them? How many months before they have submitted their state report to the committee? Uh, so I think that you're, well, they're obligated to ask you in any case, um, but it's very important to get in there as, as quickly as possible. Some states have very formal consultation processes where they have a big huge meeting with all the DPOs to talk about the state report. Um, but it, it really depends on, on how the process is working. And another thing to say is that if they don't consult with you properly, that's something to raise in your alternative report. Say that to the committee. Say we weren't consulted. Uh, Article 4.3 of, of the Convention requires that they ask uh, representative bodies of persons with disabilities about, uh, about things that affect our lives and they didn't ask us when they were writing this alternative report. And it's something that you know uh, the committee really picks up on. Um, we have another question. Here from Annette, how can we involve the members of the European Parliament to push the NGOs' alternative reports forward? Well, I mean, I think that the European Parliament are very accessible. Uh, they're the most accessible institution, at least. We've, we have a relationship with the Commission because they fund us, but actually I find that you know, MEPs are very approachable. So go to the MEPs that are in the disability intergroup, for example. You can you can find uh, the, the names of the people who are on that online. Uh, and then also lobby people from your own country. You know, I am always surprised at how much more um, I get responses from Irish MEPs because I'm Irish. Use that as leverage, you know, because they, they really care about their constituencies. Um, and, and the constituents um, that approach them, and people who are interested in, in the, the European Union. So 
uh, maybe approach them in in a in your own policy capacity as an organization, but also in your personal capacity. Um, yeah, and the disability intergroup is just one way. You can approach many uh, different different MEPs on that. Um, are there any more questions? I see another one here from Gemma. Sorry, I can't see the full. Is the medical model excluded in the case of psychiatric illness? Shouldn't it be complemented by the social model? I couldn't agree more. Um, Gemma, is it? Uh, I, I, my work at Mental Health Europe, I underline that the social model of psychiatry is in line with the social model of disability in the UNCRPD, and I push for that every time I speak um, at the European Parliament uh, with the Commission. Uh, that you know the 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 the, the medical model. Uh, of psych psychiatry is against uh, what the social model of disability is, uh, and the two things are very much they very much go hand in hand. So I I couldn't agree with you more there, uh, and I would advise anybody who has the chance to write this in an alternative report uh, to bring that up. You know that, um, and I'm actually in the middle of uh, of writing a policy position on Article 12, where I say this. You know that forced placement, forced treatment, coercive measures are underlined by a medicalized approach to to psychiatry that is not in line with the UNCRPD. Uh, I think we have another question of, from Regina. No. Do you plan to share with us the best practices and implementation of UNCRPD in mental health? It would be very useful for to us here in Poland. Um, in well, there's I mean I would have to go through that article by article, but you know one thing, um, and I I don't think I have quite the time to do it now, uh, but one thing that you can do is go onto our website and read the the position papers that we have. As I said, I'm working on one on. Um, on compliant approaches for persons with psychosocial disabilities in relation to their legal capacity. And that includes things like uh, deinstitutionalization, forced placement and forced treatment. Uh, and yeah, we promote alternatives to the use of forced placement and forced treatment here at MHG. For example, including open dialogue uh, and the Soteria model. Um, uh, and also the Trieste model, which kind of move away from using coercive measures uh, and making sure that people are making decisions about their care um, and are being supported by, by either their natural support networks or other people. Um, so yeah, uh, those are a, a few of them, but I don't have the time to kind of go into to compliant, uh, uh, compliant practices under every single article that would affect a person with a psychosocial disability today. But what I will say, uh, and I'm going to turn on the webcam as well again now so that you can see me. Um, yeah, what I will say is that we're going to do another one of these and that's why we want your feedback to see what exactly would be very helpful for you, um, you know, for the next one. Uh, so we have uh, a couple of um, suggestions at the end of the survey um, that you could suggest maybe we would do on unemployment for persons with psychosocial disabilities or maybe we could do one on, on article 19 on independent living or maybe one on, on legal capacity so this is hopefully the first in, in a line of, of human rights um, based webinars uh, where we can share um, where we can share Kind of practices maybe that that are more in line with certain articles um, so a philosophical question here I get the impression that the disability movement at large has been much more prone to use a rights-based approach in their policy work rather than us in the mental health field uh, why is that that's from Carl um, I think probably because they're the people who are affected you know uh, and I didn't say this at the outset, and I probably should have. For anybody who's not com familiar with the actual history of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it was very historic in that it actually involved 
persons with disabilities in an unprecedented manner. They were involved at every single step of the way. And what some people say to me, some states uh, who were, who, yeah, were very, people I know who were very involved in the whole process, was that each article, if persons with disabilities did not agree to the wording, then it was not adopted. Um, so, you know, people from that movement uh, who were involved in that, uh, know more about the convention, uh, but you know, Carl, I think you're you're really right. And at Mental Health Europe, what we're trying to do is to get human rights a uh, human rights based approach included even in um, even in the curriculum of of psychiatrists and uh, psychologists and also uh, social workers. Anybody who is engaged with a person with a mental health problem or a psychosocial disability should be aware of what the framework um, is. Uh, and I've seen some very um, really amazing projects where they, uh, for, for example, one in, in Sweden, uh, where they went into, and they did it with a number of different uh, types of organizations, but they went into a psychiatric ward and taught the, the users or the people with the mental health problem who were there and the staff about this. Uh, and do you know what happened? Seclusion went down. Restraint, the use of restraint went down. Um, yeah, people weren't forcibly treated as much. Uh, so I think that if if psychiatrists uh, and other mental health professionals were more aware uh, that they were actually violating people's rights uh, by 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 doing this too often, by by you know maybe forcibly treating people or forcibly placing them because it's easier rather than because it's by necessity, I think that that would really improve the situation. Um, so yeah, we, we're pushing for, for human, human rights to be taught to, to anybody who comes into interaction with a person with a psychosocial disability. Um, do you know any individual complaints from persons with psychosocial disabilities that were successful? Honestly, no, I actually don't. I, I haven't been following the individual complaints uh, so much um, because, yeah, I'm, I'm following the, mon the or monitoring uh, the EU uh, process, uh, but I can get back to you on that uh, later because I, sh I should be <laughs> uh, looking at these things. Um, there was a complaint in Hungary regarding Article 29 and the right to participate in political and public life, as well as the right to vote in 2013, and apparently that was successful. Uh, so that's the 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 main one that we're aware of. Um, but yeah, we should be looking at that a little bit more. Uh, and also, if you guys are keeping an eye on these things, please do message us as members of Mental Health Europe, uh, and even if you're not a member. Uh, of Mental Health Europe, please uh, keep us up to date. Um, we're a small staff here, so we can't monitor uh, each state's implementation. Uh, we mainly focus on our paid to, to look at EU, um, how the EU, oop, back. So I had a, a few questions for you guys. I don't know if, if you want to share some, some of your own knowledge or where you are in, in relation to implementation uh, in your own member states, but the first one is, is your country coming under review? Do you, do you know that? Um, have they reached out to you? Uh, have you been involved in the, the actual writing of this, the state review? Are you already involved in the process? If so, how are you involved? I know that you know some of you, including Regina, you were involved in actually writing an alternative report for Poland. Uh, maybe you could share a little bit about that. Uh, what are some of the issues facing Oh, you can't see it. One sec. There you go. Uh, so this is the slide that I'm reading out to you now. Um, if you're planning on writing an alternative report, are you writing it alone or with partners? Uh, I Again, I can't stress enough how important collaboration is at, at um, at national level um, and don't do it all on your own. It's really quite difficult to write these reports. Um, so yeah, if you have someone who has more capacity, you know, for example, a disab disability council, engage with them um, because you know they might be a member of a larger international organization who's giving them pointers. Um, have you gone to Geneva before for any treaty body reviews? Uh, and if, if so, how did you find the experience? Do you have any tips? Uh, and also, do you have any other questions? 
Um, I'll just check if there are any more. Thank you, Carl, for your comment, uh, and thanks for joining us. Um, and Carl, who is one of our Swedish me members, has just told us that he'll be organizing a seminar in Stockholm on human rights and mental health on the 31st of August for any Swedish uh, people who are joining us. Uh, and I think we have a list of some of the people and where you're from uh, who have joined us. We have Alzheimer Europe. so. Uh, Thank you for joining us, uh, and I know that a lot of the issues that I've mentioned will be um, will be important uh, for persons living with Alzheimer's. Uh, we have people from Spain, Greece, Portugal, Cyprus, Luxembourg. Um, so yeah, I actually mentioned that some of those uh, people, you know, or some of those countries, they're they're advancing on their review. So so do keep an eye on it. Um, I'm just going to wait to see if we have any other questions. Uh, and thank you, Carl, as well, for, for letting us know that when it's time for your report in 2018, you are going to get involved in the process and you're going to collaborate with other NGOs. Um, and yeah, he, he, Carl has also told us that he, he might not have the res resources to go to Geneva. I think that's a common complaint. Uh, Geneva is quite expensive, but um, yeah, I think sometimes it's worth worthwhile going. Uh, but also, if you are collaborating with other NGOs, if they're going and if they have funding to go, ask them to ask your questions. You know, if you've been involved in writing a report together, um, the whole thing should. I'm just going to hide my camera because it's uh, the connection is a little bit slow here. Um, um, Regina told us a little bit about her experience. In Poland, there were 20 experts writing uh, the alternative report. Um, and they sent out a questionnaire to 170 NGOs. That sounds like an amazing collaboration, actually. Um, getting that many people to be involved with it um, is, is quite good. So, yeah, I think we're going to wrap up here because uh, we don't have any more comments from anybody. But um, I think. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us, um, and I hope that I didn't speak too slowly. Um, yeah, uh, the whole thing has been recorded, uh, and unfortunately for me, it's going to go up on our website. Uh, but yeah, if if you want to watch this again, or or um, you need to to watch it more slowly, um, then you can do so. We're going to embed it on our website. Um, please, as well fill in our, our, our survey that we're going to send you later because we really do want to hear what your, your thoughts were um, on how everything went and we're going to send this presentation uh, and we'll also send resend again a link to the toolkit. Um, the toolkit is quite long but also I think it's pretty comprehensive uh, and it goes through each of the stages in probably a little bit more detail than I was able to have uh, than I was able to, to do here. Uh, so thanks again for joining us, and a thank you to Afli uh, and Charlotte, who they were scribbling away and and helping me um, with this this whole webinar. It wouldn't have been possible really without without Afli, whose whole idea it was. Um, so yeah, thanks. We're going to end the broadcast now.